look at that rain. Oh, it's coming down in absolute buckets. Dad, let Thomas do that one. Thomas? Come and give your granddad a hand, then. Come on. Tomorrow's Christmas. We can't always have a white Christmas, Thomas. You should be used to that. It shouldn't rain. Oh, it, it doesn't snow like it used to. I don't know. But then it isn't Christmas yet, is it? What? Well, it's only Christmas Eve. You mean it's going to snow tomorrow? I don't know. It might. Granddad said it's going to snow tomorrow. He didn't say that, Thomas. Dad. Here we go then. Ah, there oh, oh, it is. So isn't it time that uh, Thomas opened his Christmas Eve present then? Eh? Yeah. So, what should it be then? What's that lovely knit cap? Mm -hmm. What about that package from Uncle Di in America? Oh, he always sends uh, socks, doesn't he? Scratchy woolen socks, lovely. But you can't play with socks. Well, I think socks is a very good present. It's a rule, the Christmas Eve present has to be a toy or a book or something good. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah. So is it time now, then? Yes, please. Here you are. Happy Christmas, Thomas. Merry Christmas Eve, Thomas. Happy Christmas, Boyle. What's that, I wonder? Don't know. Come on, then, open it. This is in socks. You sure? Like it then? It's lovely, Granddad. There's a good boy. Lucky David John gave you that, didn't he? A hey, long time ago. Before I was born. Oh yes. Oh, I was born nearly. Granddad, did it snow Christmas when you were a boy? Oh yes, Thomas. It snowed. When Christmas was so much like another in those years around the sea town corner, now and out of all sound, except the distant speaking of the voices I sometimes hear a moment before sleep, that I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was 12, or whether it snowed for 12 days and 12 nights when I was six. All the Christmases rolled down towards the Welsh-speaking sea like a snowball growing whiter and bigger and rounder, like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street. And they stop at the rim of the ice-edged, fish-freezing waves. And I plunge my hands in the snow and bring out whatever I can find. Holly or robins or pudding, Squabbles and carols and oranges and tin whistles and fire in the front room and bango the crackers and holy, 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 ring the bells. <laughs> in goes my hand into that wool-white, bell-tongued ball of holidays, resting at the rim of the carol-singing sea. And out comes... Mrs. Prothero and the firemen. It was on the afternoon of Christmas Eve, and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden, waiting for cats with her son, Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December, in my memory, is white as Lapland, though there were no reindeers. But there were cats. 
patient, cold and callous. Our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball. The cats. Sleek and long as jaguars and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slink and sidle over the white back garden walls. And the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, fur-capped and moccasin trappers from Hudson Bay, off Mumbles Road, would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still, Eskimo-footed Arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows. Eternal ever since Wednesday. Have we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden? Or if we heard it at all, it was to us like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder. We ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms toward the house, and smoke indeed was pouring out of the parlour, and the gong was bombulating, and Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats in Wales standing on a wall in a row. We bounded into the house laden with snowballs and stopped at the door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning all right, but there was no fire to be seen. Only clouds of smoke, Fine. and Mr. Prothero standing in the middle of them, waving his slipper as if he were conducting. Fine Christmas. Call the fire brigade. Oh, they won't be there. It's Christmas. So. We'll do something. We threw our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Prothero and ran out of the house to the telephone box. We only called the fire brigade. And soon the fire engine came and three tall men in helmets brought a hose into the house. Mr. Prothero got out just in time before they turned it on. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas Eve. When the fireman turned off the hose and was standing in the wet, smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero, came downstairs and peered in at them. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs. Jim and I waited very quietly to hear what she would say to them. She said the right thing always. Would you like anything to read? What did she say? Eat. Years and years ago, when I was a boy, 
There were wolves in Wales. And birds. The colour of red flannel petticoats whisked past the harp-shaped hills. And we sang and wallowed all night and day in caves that smelt like Sunday afternoons and damp front farmhouse parlours. And we chased with the jawbones of deacons, the English and the bears. Before the motor car, before the wheel, before the duchess faced horse, when we rolled the daft and happy hills bareback, it snowed and it snowed. It snowed last year too. I made the snowman. My friend knocked it down, so I knocked him down. And then we had tea. Oh, but it was not the same as snow. Our snow was not only shaken from whitewashed buckets down the sky, it came surely out of the ground and swam and drifted out of the arms and bodies of the trees. Snow grew overnight on the roofs of houses, like a pure in Grandfather Moss. Minutely white ivied the walls and settled on the postman opening the gate like a dumb, numb thunderstorm of white-torn Christmas cards. Were there postmen then, too? <sighs> With sprinkling eyes and wind cherried noses on spread frozen feet, they crunched up to the doors and mittened on them manfully. But all the children could hear was the ringing of bells. You mean the postman went rat -a -tat, tat and the doors rang? I mean that the bells the children could hear were inside them. I only hear thunder sometimes, never bells. There were church bells, too. Inside them? No, no, no. In the bat-black, snow-white belfries, tugged by bishops and storks. And they rang their tidings over the bandaged town, over the frozen foam of the powder and ice cream hills over the crackling sea. It seemed that all the churches boomed for joy under my window, and the weathercocks crew for Christmas on our fence. Get back to the postman. Get away, will you? What are you doing? Oh, well, they were just ordinary postmen, fond of walking and dogs and Christmas and the snow. They knocked on the door with blue knuckles. And then they stood on the white welcome mat in the little drifted porches and huffed and puffed, making ghosts of their breath and jogged from foot to foot like small boys wanting to go out. And then the presents, after the Christmas box. Thank you. Come here. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Have a nice Christmas. Happy Christmas. And the cold postman, with a rose on his button nose, tingled down the tea tray slithered run of the chilly, glinting hill. He went in his ice-bound boots like a man on fishmonger's slabs. He wagged his bag like a frozen camel's hump, dizzily turned the corner on one foot, and by God, he was gone. Where did he go? Oh, he went to deliver letters and presents to other families. But Father Christmas brings the presents, doesn't he? He does, boy, but the, the postman uh, brings presents from people who live far away, like, uh, like Uncle Di. Will Father Christmas be able to get you in such heavy rain? Of course, boy. Why do you think he uses reindeer? I'm not going to sleep tonight. Aren't you now? Go to your bed, but I'm staying awake until Father Christmas comes, so I can see him. I used to try that. Did you ever see him? No, I never did. But on Christmas Eve, milk and biscuits waiting by the fire, I would hang at the foot of my bed Bessie Bunter's black stocking. And always, I said, I would stay awake all the moonlit night to hear the roof alighting reindeer and see the hollowed boot descend through soot.
But soon the sand of the snow drifted into my eyes. And though I stared toward the fireplace and around the flickering room where the black sack-like stocking hung, I was asleep before the chimney trembled and the room was red and white with Christmas. Then, in the morning, though no snow melted on the bedroom floor, the stocking bulged and brimmed. It was Christmas. sleeping through it, do you, with all your aunties and uncles here? Uh, Katie, do you know where that photo is? What photo? You know, why are they all dressed up? Oh, Dad, I'm trying to get the boy to bed. Oh, just a minute, I know it's here. Oh, you're hopeless. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, here we are, then. That's you. Oh, I'd forgotten how. Oh, more it. Look, Katie. Oh, silly. Look. Now, these were the useful presents, engulfing mufflers of the old coach days, and mittens made for giant sloths, zebra scarves of a substance like silky gum that could be tug of war down to the galoshes, blinding tam shanters like patchwork tea cozies and bunny-suited busbies and balaclavas for victims of head-shrinking tribes. From aunts who always wore wool next to the skin, there were moustached and rasping vests that made you wonder why the aunts had any skin left at all. And once, I had a little crocheted nose bag from an aunt, alas, no longer whinnying with us. And pictureless books, in which small boys, though warned with quotations not to, would skate on Farmer Giles's pond, and did, and drowned. And books that told me everything about the wasp, except why. Go on, go on to the useless presents. Oh, yes, the useless presents. Are you going to send me some tickets? You have? Yeah, please. Okay. Well, there were bags of moist and many-coloured jelly babies, and a folded flag, and a false nose, and a tram conductor's cap, and a machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Yes, please. Were you going to have for you? Never. A catapult. Once, by a mistake that no one could explain, a little hatchet. Oh, and a celluloid duck that made, when you pressed it, a most unduck-like sound. A mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow. <laughs> and a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the sea and the animals any colour I pleased. And still the dazzling sky-blue sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow-billed and pea-green birds. We had hard boils, toffee, fudge and all sorts, crunches, cracknels, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan and butter Welsh for the Welsh. There was a company, gallant and scarlet, but never nice to taste, though I always tried when very young, of belted and Busbid and musketed lead soldiers, so soon to lose their heads and legs in the wars. Troops who, if they could not fight, could always run.
Then there were snakes and families and happy ladders and easy hobby games for little engineers, complete with instructions. Easy. <laughs> oh, easy for Leonardo. Cheers. Oh, you were coming to you. Here you are. Still drinking, I see. Oh, don't you worry, Auntie. It's Christmas Day. Oh. Let's have a happy time. Oh. And a whistle to make the dogs bark, to wake up the old man next door, to make him beat on the wall with his stick, to shake our picture off the wall. Be quiet. Oh. And then it was breakfast under the balloons. Were the uncles like in our house? There are always uncles at Christmas. The same uncles. Would you like some tea, Auntie? Oh, no, thank you, dear. Both of you acting like children. It was him. Uh, him. Uh. <laughs> Auntie Bessie played Pop Goes the Weasel and Nuts in May and Oranges and Lemons on the untuned piano in the parlor all through the thimble hiding, musical cheering, blind man's bluffing party on the never to be forgotten day at the end of the unremembered year. And on Christmas mornings, I would go out with my packet of cigarettes. You put one in your mouth, and you stood at the corner of the street, and you waited for hours in vain for an old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and then, with a smirk, you ate it. Then, with dog-disturbing whistles and sugar fags, I would scour the swatched town for news of the little world and find always a dead bird by the white post office or by the deserted swings. Perhaps a robin, all but one of its fires out, and that fire still burning on his breast. Men and women wading or scooping back from chapel with taproom noses and wind-bust cheeks, all albinos, huddle the stiff, black, jarring feathers against the irreligious snow. Mistletoe hung from the gas brackets in all the front parlours. There was sherry and walnuts and bottled beer and crackers by the dessert spoons. And cats in their furabouts watched the fires and the high-heaped fire spat, all ready for the chestnuts and the mulling pokers. Some few large men sat in the front parlours without their collars uncles almost certainly, trying their new cigars, holding them out judiciously at arm's length, returning them to their mouths, coughing, then holding them out again as though waiting for an explosion. And some few small aunts, not wanted in the kitchen, 
nor anyone else for that matter, sat on the very edges of their chairs, poised and brittle, afraid to break like faded cups and saucers. Not many those mornings trod the piling streets. An old man always, fawn bowlered, yellow gloved, and at this time of year, with spats of snow, would take his constitutional to the white bowling green and back, as he would take it wet or fine on Christmas Day or Doomsday. Sometimes, two hale young men with big pipes blazing, no overcoats and wind-blown scarves, would trudge unspeaking down to the forlorn sea. To work up an appetite, to blow away the fumes, who knows? To walk into the waves until nothing of them was left but the two curling smoke clouds of their inextinguishable briars. Then I would be slap-dashing home, the gravy smell of the dinners of others, the bird smell, the brandy, the pudding and mince coiling up to my nostrils. When out of a snow-clogged side lane would come a boy, the spit of myself, with a pink-tipped cigarette and the violet past of a black eye, cocky as a bullfinch, leering all to himself. I hated him on sight and sound and would be just about to put my dog whistle to my lips and blow him off the face of Christmas when suddenly he, with a violent wink, put his whistle to his lips and blew so stridently, so high, so exquisitely loud that doubling faces, that cheeks bulged with goose, would press against their tinseled windows the whole length of the white, echoing street. <laughs> If at first you don't succeed, give up. <laughs> For dinner, we had turkey stuffed with walnut dressing, little potatoes, and wine. Always wine. That was done, we had blazing pudding. Someone found the silver threepenny bit with a current on it, and the someone was always Uncle Arnold. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Don't bother, boy. I got the threepenny bit right here. Oh, <laughs> oh look. There's a shoe nut. Have you got a shoehorn to open it with, boy? <laughs> and after dinner, the uncles sat in front of the fire, loosened all buttons, put their large, moist hands over their watch chains, groaned a little, and slept. Oh, thank you, Auntie. 
Uh. Better in than out. Mothers, aunts and sisters scuttled to and fro, bearing tureens. Auntie Bessie, who had already been frightened twice by a clockwork mouse, whimpered at the sideboard and had some elderberry wine. The dog was sick. Auntie Dozy had to have three aspirins. But Auntie Hannah, who liked port, stood in the middle of the snowbound backyard, singing like a big bosom thrush. Drinking the whole day. Oh, she's tiddly as a newt. Maybe she won't even notice the cold then. For an old man's gold. I would blow up balloons to see how big they would blow up too. And when they burst, which they all did, the uncles jumped and rumbled. In the rich and heavy afternoon, the uncles breathing like dolphins and the snow descending. I would sit among festoons and Chinese lanterns and nibble dates and try to make a model man of war following the instructions for little engineers. But instead, I would produce what might be mistaken for a sea-going tram car. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that on the afternoon of Christmas Day, when the others sat around the fire and told each other that this was nothing, no nothing, to the great snowbound and turkey-proud Yule log-cracking Holly, berry, bedizened, and kissing under the mistletoe Christmas when they were children. I would go out, my bright new boots squeaking, into the white world, onto the seaward hill, to call on Jim and Dan and Jack, and to pad through the still streets, leaving huge, deep footprints on the hidden pavement. coming down the street. I'd go like this, bang. I'd throw him over the railings, I'd roll him down the hill, I'd tick him on the and he'd wag his tail. What would you do if you saw two hippos? <laughs> <laughs> Iron flanked and bellowing he hippos clanked and battered through the scudding snow toward us as we passed Mr. Daniel's house. What shall we do? Let's post Mr. Daniel a snowball through his letterbox. Let's write things in the snow. Let's write. Mr. Daniel looks like a spaniel all over his lawn. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wicked boy! Turn off! 
And then we walked along the white shore. The silent, one-clouded heavens drifted onto the sea. Now we were snow-blind travellers lost on the North Hills. And vast, dew-lapped dogs with flasks round their necks ambled and shambled up to us, baying, Excelsior! We returned home through the poor streets where only a few children fumbled with bare red fingers in the wheel-rutted snow and cut called after us. Their voices fading away as we trudged uphill into the cries of the dock birds and the hooting of ships out in the whirling bay. And then, at tea, the recovered uncles would be jolly, and the iced cake loomed in the centre of the table like a marble grave. Auntie Hannah laced her tea with rum, because it was only once a year. It all sounds like an ordinary Christmas to me. And it was. Christmas when you were a boy wasn't any different to Christmas now. Oh, but it was, it was. Why was Christmas different then? <clears throat> I mustn't tell you. Why can't Christmas be the same for me as it was for you when you were a boy? I mustn't tell you. Because it's Christmas now. You ought to be in bed, young man. Grandad was telling me a story. <sighs> well, it's past your bedtime. Thomas? Oh, he's just about to go up. Where are you going now? I have to listen to my father Christmas. Oh, he's so excited. He'll stay awake all night if you allow him to. It would be nice if it snowed for him, mind. Well, it's a big day tomorrow. I, I think I'll go to bed. Good night, Dad. Good Thanks night, for Dad. keeping an eye on him. Oh, there's no trouble. It's a pleasure. He sits there good as gold while I ramble on. He seems interested, too. <laughs> Is that enough for Father Christmas, do you think? Can I need more? Oh, don't worry, Buck. If he wants some more, he'll know where to find them. Hope so, anyway. Come along, Thomas. I'll tuck you in. <laughs> good night, then, son. Good night, Carrie. Oh, and, uh, Thomas, remember, not too early, right? All right, Granddad. Is this how the town looked like when you were up? Oh, yeah, it was just the same. Good night. Don't you dare. Ho, ho, ho. Would you like to hear more? Yes, please. Bring out the tall tales now that we told by the fire as we roasted chestnuts and the gaslight bubbled low. Ghosts with their heads under their arms trailed their chains 
once and said, Ooh, like owls in the long night when I dare not look over my shoulder. Wild beasts lurked in the cubbyhole under the stairs where the gas meter ticked. I remember we went singing carols once when there wasn't a shaving of a moon to light the flying street. At the end of a long road was a drive that led to a large house, and we stumbled up the darkness of the drive that night, each one of us afraid, each one holding a stone in his hand, in case, and all of us too brave to say a word. The wind through the trees made noises as of old and unpleasant, and maybe web-footed men wheezing in caves. We reached the black bulk of the house. What shall we give them? Hark the herald. Christmas comes but once a year? No, no. Go King Welch's loss. I'll count three. One, two, three. Good King Wenchless last looked out on the feast of Stephen. And we began to sing, our voices high and seemingly distant in the snow-felted darkness round the house that was occupied by nobody we knew. Though the frost was cruel, we stood close together near the dark door. And then a small, dry voice of someone who has not spoken for a long time joined our singing. A small, dry, eggshell voice from the other side of the door. A small, dry voice through the keyhole. Thou and I shall see him dine when we bear them fear. And when we stopped running, we were outside our house. Perhaps it was a ghost. Perhaps it was Troll. Dan was always reading. Let's go in and see if there's any gentlemen. The front room was lovely. Balloons floated under the hot water bottle gulping gas. Everything was good again and shone over the town. on Christmas night there was music. An uncle played the fiddle, a cousin sang Cherry Ripe, and another uncle sang Drake's Drum. Drake is in his hammock and a thousand mile away. Captains are the sleeping there below. Slung between the round shot in Nombrostios Bay, 
and dreaming all the time of Plymouth Ho. Yonder looms the island, yonder lie the ships, with sailor lads up dancing heel and toe. And the shore lights flashing, and the night tide dashing, he sees it all so plainly as he saw it long ago. It was very warm in the house. Auntie Hannah, who had got onto the parsnip wine, sang a song about bleeding hearts and death, and then another in which she said her heart was like a bird's nest. And then everybody laughed again. On her beauty so amazing, all transfixed, he stood there gazing. On the fairest, she seemed rarest. A smile did shed a own fresh beauty. She shone an angel to his view. To love her was but duty. Why don't we sing? Why don't we sing all through the night? Looking out through my bedroom window, out into the moonlight and the unending smoke-colored snow, I could see the lights in the windows of all the other houses on our hill, and hear the music rising from them of the long, steadily falling night. I turned the gas down. I got into bed. I said some words to the close and holy darkness. And then I slept. 